In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, try and true. Most sacred heart of Jesus, who is truly present in the Holy Eucharist. We surrender ourselves to you this evening to fill us with your grace and help each one of us to be a sanctuary for you. Here and beyond this Eucharistic Congress, wherever we go, that we might be a living sanctuary for you. We ask all this in your most holy name. Amen. The name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. It's a great joy and a blessing for me to be with all of you here. I will be honest, when I was invited, I was very surprised and also nervous. I grew up in a small village. We didn't even have 1,000 people. So I didn't know how I was going to be here with all of you. Even this morning in passing, when I was you know, meeting different people, including some bishops, when they knew that I'm speaking this evening, jokingly and lovingly, they said, oh, mother, but they won't see you on the stage. <laughs> Which is true. And then when we have our prep meeting this evening with the rest of our speakers, one of the team members asked me, said, Mother, would you like a podium? So I just did like this. I said, without podium, they might not see me, so with the podium will be even more challenging. But I didn't come here trusting in my height would be enough for you to see me or that I know a lot about everything that we are going to hear these days. This morning in my prayer, the Lord reminded me the story of Peter and the fishermen when they spent all night fishing and they didn't cut anything. It was the Lord who filled their nets. I was reminded again in the wedding of Cana when they ran out of wine it was the Lord who transformed their jars and changed the water into wine. And I was reminded again of the story when the disciples were asked by Jesus to feed the crowd, more than today's crowd. It was the Lord who blessed their baskets and filled them. I am here with you to give all of us whether our empty nets, our empty jars, or our empty baskets. My prayer with you and for you that we all will be filled by our Lord Jesus through the Holy Eucharist. So please receive what I'm going to share with you from my heart, and I pray that it will touch your heart in whatever way you need him today to touch you. I am going to share a few stories about how I encountered Jesus in the breaking of the bread and the brokenness of human life, including my own life. I was brought up in a very troubled home, and I experienced a lot of abuse, physical, emotional, and mentally as well. I experienced four wars from early childhood to early adulthood. In my teenage years, I found myself in positions 
With my two hands, I have to bury a lot of people who died during war. Also, from very young age, before even graduating from high school, the Lord led me to minister to those who were injured because of war. Many people have their full body burned from bombs and missiles and people without leg or arm or eyes. So experiencing the trauma of my own household and the trauma of war, it's easy for all of us when we are faced with tragedies and difficulties, we doubt why God allowed such things to happen. Why me? Correct? We all find ourselves sometimes asking these questions in difficult times. Even though I wasn't Catholic at that time, but it was really Our Lady and the Sacred Heart of Jesus that saved me from the darkness of time that I was living in. The Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Holy Rosary became like the lighthouse for me in the midst of storms of my own life. Of course, there is no time tonight for me to share the full story of my childhood all the way until I became a religious sister and became Catholic. But I assure you, if it wasn't the grace of God and the intercession of Our Lady and the heart of Jesus, if I was still alive, probably I would have been homeless, lost my mind somewhere in the street of where I grew up. But it was the grace of God and His loving heart that kept me safe. All these years of suffering led me to the foot of the cross because I thought the one who have suffered so much will understand my suffering. And as I was kneeling at the foot of the cross, crying my heart to Jesus to help me bury the crosses of my own life, I encountered the pierced heart of Jesus. And that, what I heard in my heart on that day, that even on the cross and through the cross, we can still choose to love. As Saint Mother Teresa always used to say, true love, in order to be real, sometimes it hurts and it caused. And it is true, the path of love and forgiveness that I chose, forgiving those who have done so much wrong to me in my childhood and teenage years and adulthood, and also forgiving all the trauma of war and those who caused those tragedies in my mind and my heart. Until today, I experience nightmares that I barely can sleep at night. In the United States, as you know, 4th of July is a very important celebration. My poor daughters, the sisters in the convent, I always tell them, I'm sorry I cannot take them to see fireworks because all that sound, it reminds me of the missiles and the bombs of war. Having experienced the mercy of the heart of Jesus and the maternal care of the Blessed Mother, let me to get to know him even more in the Holy Eucharist. I love going to Catholic churches when I was little and watching the sanctuary candle. That is when I knew Jesus is here and present. That's what drew me to him whenever I visited a church and I found the Blessed Sacrament. I knew there I was safe and protected and loved and healed from any abuse or pain or trauma. I start sleeping with the cross and rosary in my hand, which is something I still do until today. I encounter Jesus in the breaking of the bread and in my own brokenness. Fast forward, when I became Catholic and I became a religious sister, I was visiting one of the churches in Boston during the marathon weekend, which as those of you who might know, it's a very big weekend in Boston. People come from all around the world for Boston Marathon. I remember as I attended mass in one of the churches, the priest asked me, because there were so many visitors, 
the priest asked me if I can help with the distribution of the communion. And I happily did because I love bringing Jesus to people. So as I went and received the pattern from the priest, I noticed there was a piece of the broken consecrated host that the priest uses in the pattern. And I was so excited to see a young family coming down the aisle. And I asked the parents if the children have received First Communion. And I was told the little girl had received. So I picked that piece of the consecrated host and I gave it to this little girl. At the end of Mass, her family approached me and they said, Mother, we want to share something with you. Our daughter told us when we went back to the pew after communion. She went and she knelt next to her parents and she kept nudging their arm to tell them something important. And she said, Mom, Dad, the nun gave me the broken Jesus. The nun gave me the broken Jesus. Maybe that was the language of the child. But the truth, my brothers and sisters, yes, indeed, you and I, we believe in the broken Jesus. Jesus who allowed himself to be broken, his heart to be pierced out of love for all of us. I am grateful for my broken Jesus because that is where I encountered him to heal my own brokenness and the brokenness of the people that I've been blessed with my community to be able to serve. Please allow me to share with you a few stories where I have seen the living Eucharistic miracle in the brokenness of people's life. Throughout the history, when we hear about Eucharistic miracles, it means the Lord revealed himself truly present in the Holy Eucharist. And that's why people call it Eucharistic miracle. The people that we serve are people who battle cancer, addiction, ALS, Parkinson's, mental illnesses, the focus of our ministry is the corporate works of mercy. And I cannot tell you, in all these places that we serve, how much I have seen Eucharistic miracle happens over and over in the life of people. I want to begin first with the story of a little boy. He's famously known in Boston as Mighty Quinn, or those of you who have seen him or his story from Massachusetts on social media. My little Quinny was diagnosed with cancer when he was not yet quite three years old. I didn't know him at that time. This is my dear Quinny. At that time, I didn't know this little child. He went through chemo, radiation, many surgeries. And then he did very well for about 10 months, but sadly, the cancer came back. The second time, it was very scary for his parents. And somebody told them to go to the convent and pray with the sisters. They came to our convent, as you saw in the first picture, him holding a cross. We have a prayer room with about 45 relics of saints, including the true relic of the cross. I gave that to little Quinny and I prayed with him. As they were leaving, I went back to the chapel and I prayed more for him. And I felt in my heart Jesus saying, give me to him, give me to him. And I thought that would be in prayer that I will send Jesus to be with him. But 24 hours later, that voice in my heart, I kept hearing Jesus saying, give me to him. And then I thought maybe the Lord wants me to give him communion, but he wasn't quiet yet five. So I decided to call our archdiocese and talk to a canon lawyer to see if for pastoral reason, because of the seriousness of his cancer, if he will be allowed to receive his first communion. And grateful to our Archbishop Cardinal Sean O'Malley and the canon lawyer of our diocese, the permission was granted. We had very short window before he was beginning his radiation. 48 hours. 
I went to his parents and I said, I think Jesus wants to accompany Kuni in his 33 days of radiation. He would be receiving his first communion. I remember his father called me aside and he said, why you want to give first communion to my son? Is he dying? I said, I don't have the answer about the length of his life, but I know Jesus wants to be with him. 48 hours later, I got him the white suit that you saw in the earlier picture, and my dear little Kuni received his first communion. For 33 days, Kuni received communion every Sunday. And when he was able, I brought him before the Blessed Sacrament for a visit with Jesus. All his doctors and medical teams, they were surprised that 33 days radiation had very little effect on him in terms of side effects. But you and I, we know who was taking all that from him. It was Jesus in the Eucharist. I remember before his scan and surgery, I went with him to every scan and every MRI. I remember he was afraid of losing his hair. And I told him, I said, we both can be bald together. So he came to the convent and we decided, I don't know if that slide was used earlier, but we both, Quinny and I, shaved our head together. Maybe some of you know Baby Yoda. So Quinny loves Baby Yoda. That's the picture the day that Quinny and I shaved our head, and he got me Baby Yoda's hat just like him. I have been very blessed accompanying Quinny the last three years, and he moved from one miracle to another. Thanks be to God, even the doctors and his medical team they were wondering how he managed all the treatment, all the surgeries, radiation, and more chemo. He became an inspiration because of his faith. Even when he was given a chance to go to Disney, he said to his mom, make sure you book the flight Sunday after Mass, and we have to come back on Saturday so we won't miss the Mass. His whole life became around the Eucharist. And thanks be to God and to the power of the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady, today our dear Quinny is free of cancer. He's a mighty warrior for Jesus. Just a little bit over a year ago, last May, May 23rd, I was invited to a hospital, which is something I do often in all the Boston hospitals. I was invited to visit this little girl. Her poor parents tried to conceive so many times, but it didn't work. And the last time they were pregnant with twin, a boy and a girl. I didn't know the couple, but I was invited by their friend. When I went to the hospital, sadly, at week 22, they had to have emergency C-session. The little boy didn't survive, and the girl was just one pound, and they had little hope for her to survive. Because I go to the hospital regularly to visit other patients, I always have the pics with me with the Holy Eucharist. And I ask the nurses at the NICU if they will give me permission to open the window in the incubator, as you can see, and put the pigs inside the incubator, close to her body. Little Emma was in the incubator for 191 days. The doctors were so worried. Her kidney were not developed. Her lungs were not developed. They have fears about her sight. I was so moved one day when I put the pigs, as you can see, her tiny fingers reach out to Jesus. On that day, I said to Jesus, please hold her hand because she's reaching out to you. For 191 days, 
Jesus and I never missed a Sunday visiting baby Emma. She grew so healthy, thanks be to God. She just needed one heart surgery when she was younger. 191 days, then we had a graduation party for her when she left the NICU. This past Monday, uh, sorry, this past May, May 26, I went to her home and we celebrated Emma's one year birthday. Now she weighs 18 pounds. And you can see she smashed her cake. In the hospital, every Sunday when I went with the pigs to the NICU, to put it in the incubator next to Emma's body. All the nurses and doctors, they knew there was something special in Emma's room. They started calling it Emma's chapel. And every Sunday, they said, Jesus is coming to visit Emma. That was another Eucharistic miracle. The Lord revealed the power of his real presence in the Holy Eucharist by saving the life of this youngest child ever in that hospital to survive and fully develop and live healthy without any side effect of being premature. Only Jesus can do that. Thanks be to God, these are the two beautiful stories of the power of our Eucharistic Lord, how he give life and give it abundantly in the life of Queenie and life of Emma. One of our other ministries, we minister to those who battle addiction and their families. And please allow me, those of you here who have loved ones either lost to addiction or still battling addiction, I pray for you every day. And I have great admiration for every husband, wife, every child, every mother, every father who have accompanied a loved one in this path of recovery. Part of our ministry of ministering to these men in recovery, sometimes we encounter some who have never received sacraments. We help them to receive First Communion or Confirmation. And sometimes, whatever way they need to grow in their faith. We have Bible study for them to grow in their relationship with the Lord through the Word of God. One of the men in this group, his name David, you're gonna see his picture. This is my dear David, who battled addiction since he was nine years old because his father was a drug dealer. David was one of the four boys in his family all the three were gone, and two of them to overdose. David battled about 40 years of his life, childhood, teen years, and adulthood in addiction. In the year and a half that I got to know David, he loved the Eucharist. He loved adoration. He never missed Sunday Mass. He loved singing out loud. He used to sit the first pew by the choir so he can sing louder and louder and louder. And those of you who know somebody who has battled addiction, it's a hard road. Sometimes they move one step forward and two backward. When David was sober and he was able to keep a job, at the end of each week he used to come and give me $20 and say, "Mother." would you take them to the single mothers and the babies that you serve? Because that's the shelter where we serve of single mothers and their babies. I learned as I got to know David that throughout his adulthood, he fathered four children, but he was never part of their lives. It almost was David's way of giving his paycheck to paycheck to these single mothers and their babies it was his way of trying in his heart to reconcile with his children that he never knew or kept because of his addiction. Sadly, after a year and a half of trying so hard, 
David overdosed and lost his life. David wasn't from our town or our area. I had to travel for his funeral. And as you can imagine, somebody who lived 40 years in recovery and path of addiction, the church was full of people who knew him from that way of life. And all his siblings were deceased, his father. So his mother, when she saw me in the communion line, she asked the priest if he would invite me to come up front and say, how did I know David? So I came to the front and I introduced myself and I told them how David used to come every Sunday to Mass, every week to adoration, every Wednesday to Bible study. He even became a confirmation sponsor for one of the men in recovery. In those dark times, the Eucharist, adoration, and Masses became like a lighthouse for David. And I told them, I can only imagine when David made it to the gate of heaven, Jesus met him with hands full of $20, saying to David, as you did it for my least brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Come into your eternal place of rest. Yes, David didn't receive the miracle of life on this side of heaven, but I do believe in faith. Through the mercy of the heart of Jesus, David received abundant life on the other side of heaven. The last story, it was April of last year. Because of our ministry with cancer patients, I met this beautiful mama 39 years old with two children who has battled cancer for many years. Her youngest, he was only eight months old when mama was diagnosed with cancer. And he was almost four in this picture. And his sister was six years old. They tried everything. I met her seven months before she passed away. Jill wasn't married in the church. They weren't very active at that point in their walk with the Lord. But those seven months became, again, a turning point in her life and faith journey. The divine mercy became everything to her. She held that blanket with her everywhere, every hospital visit, every treatment, every trip. She clothed herself with divine mercy blanket. I remember last year during Holy Week, when we knew she, has, she had very little time left, she said to me, Mother, I always dreamed that one day I will see my daughter walking down the aisle. I didn't think that will never happen. I told Jill, I said, I might not be able to give you that wish to see your daughter walking down the aisle, but you can see her walking down the aisle to receive her first communion. That was Tuesday of the Holy Week, and I knew she had maximum about a week left. Again, I called our archdiocese because the girl was six years old, and it was a pastoral request to see if this girl would receive first communion while mommy is alive. I went to her in the hospital on Holy Thursday, and I said to her, your baby girl will receive communion on Easter Sunday, and you will walk her down the aisle. And she said to me, she said, Mother, I always thought I will give her my veil. So I asked her permission if I can get her veil, wedding veil. I went to her home, and I got the wedding veil, and I cut piece of it and made a veil for her daughter for her first communion. I hang it in her hospital room, and I prayed that she will make it through Easter Sunday. On Holy Saturday, I went to the hospital and I said to the doctor, I have to take her to the church tomorrow. I brought her home Saturday night and Sunday morning she dressed her baby girl and she put that veil on her. She ended up walking her down the aisle even though she was in a wheelchair. Few days later, 
Jill took her last breath after her children came and gave a kiss of goodbye to mommy. Again, yes, Jill didn't receive the miracle of life on this side of heaven, but I do believe and her family believe that Jill received the gift of life and have it abundantly in heaven because of her faith and the faith of her family. And I want you to join me today to give thanks to God for the miracle, Eucharistic miracle that happened in the life of this woman when her husband approached me just a couple weeks ago, who is not Catholic, and said, Mother, can I start RCAA and become Catholic? <laughs> Last but not the least, when I was in prison ministry, the priest came on Easter day to bring Holy Communion to the prisoners. And as he gave Holy Communion to one of the prisoners who was a little bit mentally disturbed, I noticed the prisoners didn't receive the Holy Eucharist, but he put it in his pocket. And I was so anxious and worried, so I ran toward him and I said, please, if you don't want to receive the Eucharist, give him to me. And he noticed I had a Bible in my hand. So he said to me, if you give me the book, I will give you the Eucharist. And I couldn't wait to get the Eucharist back. So I extend my hand to pass the book to him. And I said, you can take it, but please just give me the Eucharist. As he hold on the book, he put his other hand in his pocket and he received the Holy Eucharist. And then he starts spinning around the room and saying, I have him. Nobody can take him away from me. I have him. Nobody can take him away from me. Yes, at that moment, maybe you might think this prisoner made, you know, got a trick on mother. He got the book and he got the Eucharist. But when I think about it, my brothers and sisters, we Catholics, members of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, we are so blessed to have the Eucharist every day at Mass, at every chapel to adore Him, to praise Him, to honor Him. In a way, we all can say, we have Him and nobody can take Him away from us. We have Him and nobody can take Him away from us. Thank you for allowing me to share these few stories with you. I pray that wherever you are in your life, in your own journey, or the journeys of your loved ones, whatever empty net you have, or empty jar, or empty basket, go to the foot of the cross. Go to Jesus, for he alone can fill every emptiness, every void in our lives. I remember with Quinny's story when the doctors asked why I was so insisting that he would receive communion regularly. And they said to his mom, we do believe he is a miracle. My point is, my brothers and sisters, there are many Eucharistic miracles in our midst. To witness the power of the body of Christ working miracles in people's life whether physical healing like Quinny and Emma or spiritual healing like David and Jill. I give thanks to God for allowing me to be present and to witness these miracles so I can come and be a voice for him and for them so that you go out and share with everybody. Eucharistic miracles are real and our Lord truly present and he's here in our midst wherever you go any parish any church any diocese as last night one of our bishops said he is here whether in big processions like we have encountered here or i've seen him present also in hospitals NICUs nursing homes prisons recovery centers it's the same Jesus as St Paul says of yesterday, today, and forever. How blessed we are to have him 
and nobody can take him away from us. I want you to repeat this with me. We have him and nobody can take him away from us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning. Thank you, and God bless you. I will keep you in my prayers. Thank you. Thank you so much.